Hello, uh, everyone, and welcome. My name is uh, Richard Oram, and I'm a large facilities advisor here at the National Science Foundation. And it's my pleasure to welcome you to the 2022 Research Infrastructure Webinar Series. Our webinar today will be on the topics of metrics for research infrastructure performance. And, uh, and that will be followed later on today with another webinar uh, starting at 2 p.m. Eastern. And that webinar will be on science impact metrics. So we, we have a, uh, just going through some of the, uh, the run through for, for today's uh, webinar or this morning's webinar. Uh, the, the panel uh, is a superb panel that's been uh, been assembled here. We'll discuss best practices for collecting and calculating and reporting metrics, and uh, they, they will uh, be looking into the the question of you know how how would good performance metrics help demonstrate whether a facility is reaching its goals or um, appropriately. So the, the, the format for today is the panelists are going to introduce themselves uh, and, and run through their briefly uh, in five minutes or so, presenting their perspective on performance metrics. And then we'll move to a, a, a moderated session with the panelists, where, where the panelists will be asking some, uh, answering some pre-developed questions. Um, that should take out another... Uh, hopefully uh, 30 to 40 minutes. And then we will have um, a, uh, the balance of the time, maybe uh, 10 minutes for, the, for, for you to ask uh, questions of the panelists through the uh, Q&A chat function. And um, so please, uh, as we go through this, start thinking up, thinking up your, um, your questions. Now, uh, some logistical, uh, so th this is the panel uh, here and they'll be introducing themselves shortly. Some logistical uh, things, if uh, perhaps number one, this session will be recorded and it will be available on demand at, uh, at the NSF Research Infrastructure Knowledge Sharing Gateway, um, probably in a, in a week or so. Uh, for closed captions, please follow the link that's been posted in the chat. And uh, I am now uh, pleased to present uh, Matt Palanza from the Ocean, uh, Ocean Observatories Initiative. And please, uh, please take it away, uh, Matt. Uh, thank you, as Richard said, my name is Matthew Palanza. I'm, uh, I'm with the Ocean Observatories Initiative. Uh, the Ocean Observatories Initiative is a network of arrays that are deployed in oceans around the globe. Uh, the initial deployments were in seven locations, two of which were in the Southern Hemisphere, which were later redacted due to budget constraints, although that data is still available. Uh, the remaining five are in the Northern Hemisphere. In the Northeast Pacific, we have a cabled array operated by the University of Washington. Uh, that provides high data bandwidth, high power, uh, telecommunications-based infrastructure across the seafloor, across uh, the very seismically active areas. Uh, in uh, continue staying in that region, we have uh, two lines uh, north and south of the Columbia River uh, operated by the Oregon State University called the Coastal Endurance Array. Uh, that is made up of moored assets, so uh, surface expressions uh, with a variety of instrumentation up and down the riser and on the seafloor, as well as a small fleet of autonomous underwater vehicles as mobile assets. On the, in the eastern world, in the Atlantic Ocean, uh, we have a similar array in the Coastal Pioneer, as it's called, uh, operated by the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution, which is where I am also working. Uh, this is, again, a very similar array across the shelf break, the continental shelf break, which is made up of moored assets. Uh, several profiling assets are located around, actually, all the arrays. Uh, and again, a small fleet of autonomous underwater vehicles, as well as a couple of expedition-driven, uh, propeller-driven AUVs. Uh, moving to 60 degrees north in a very hostile environment, we have, again, another array with subsurface moorings and a surface expression 
off of the Greenland tip jet uh, uh, in, um, in the Erminger Sea. Uh, this is a pretty significant amount of oceanographic equipment. Uh, on a yearly basis, we mount seven major expeditions. The intention is that this data is brought to shore and available to anybody with an internet connection. Uh, and we're doing the industrial strength heavy lifting uh, for scientists to utilize onshore or actually anybody who does want to use it. Uh, this program is in its operations and management phase. In 2018, the groups I just listed, as well as Rutgers University, uh, formed a consortium to uh, actually bid for the management change. In, um, and uh, that bid was successful. And in October of 2018, the Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution took over the program management of the, of the OOI program. Uh, Ethan, can I get the next slide? From there, uh, so this program had been in its operations and management phase for a couple of years at that time. Uh, but there were some concerns. We, from a systems engineering point of view, from my seat, uh, the, the level of maturity was unfortunately a bit low of the program. Uh, the, there were some key personnel who had left several years before, four years prior to that, who were not replaced. So their function was, their systems engineering function at the program level was never, never maintained uh, really beyond the acceptance testing phase of the program. So uh, understanding that, um, my tactic was to use a, a, a program management tool called the Capability Maturity Model and, uh, and tailor the definitions to uh, the program that I was specifically working on. The Capability Maturity Model is something that came out of Carnegie Mellon uh, for the development of large scale software programs. And essentially it is a scale of one to five with specific definitions that you can rate or apply metrics to. Uh, so uh, the, the primary work there was to, to um, adapt and tailor the definitions to the OOI program. Ethan, can I get the next slide? So this is something that can be tabulated both in terms of uh, specific actions and quantified over time. Uh, so the initial assessment uh, was was not good. Uh, th there were a lot of sy systems engineering processes that were put in place, but were not adapted, were not tailored, were not updated for the operations and management phase. Uh, but there was some initial work that we could do. So essentially, this is a table that I actually use, a metrics table that I actually use to, to report to my program manager. Uh, and our initial uh, um, efforts were in uh, especially learning about what we needed to do. So the first column, uh, the, the items highlighted in green, for example, we take actions such as listening to already existing cross uh, program working groups, uh, as well as create new ones as needed in an ad hoc fashion uh, for specific uh, actions. Uh, there were some, uh, we did initiate some, some new uh, activities, which I'll describe a, a little bit more in detail in our upcoming slides, and uh, to develop some program wide systems engineering metrics. These the for the remainder of the column are specific actions that are that are documented. Uh, these are these are program management systems engineering processes that are uh, all captured in controlled documentation, which is updated and maintained throughout the the lifespan of the project. The major directive here is to make sure that the the marine implementing organizations that are doing this actual work have the tools necessary to ensure that the marine infrastructure that we are deploying. Uh, will be operational for the duration of the program with all of the constraints such as risks or flat budget and that type of thing as we move forward. Uh, next slide, please. So on a regular basis, this is essentially what our process looks like. We are continuously, we are, you know, looking for continuous improvement. Uh, we had to, our initial learning curve was to look at the MIO level, that marine infrastructure, uh, marine implementing organization structure uh, and look at, for example, each of these, uh, each of these institutions was doing due diligence. Uh, they had their own variety of performance metrics and tracking. Uh, a lot of them were quite similar, but they were not entirely uniform. Uh, we had to do quite a bit of work to create a common lingua franca to be able to uh, establish metrics that were actually comparable to each other. Uh, so essentially on a weekly or even um, more often basis, 
those team processes are feeding up to the program management office and they are now running through defined, uh, defined processes. There are metrics in terms of operational status. Uh, there are you know, efforts to deal with obsolescence or, or design flaws in the engineering change request process. Uh, issues that occur, we ensure that now there's an issue resolution tracking mechanism uh, so that we, we are really tracking to understand that issues that have been identified are being taken to a, a successful resolution. And obviously a risk management register, which is something that we're looking to be predictive rather than reactive. So all of those metrics feed into uh, the program management office at the program level, and uh, we derive from those various statuses and metrics. metrics. Uh, one very good aspect of it, this is, is it does we do a, a report now on a weekly, quarterly, and annual uh, annual uh, rate to our program officers at the NSF. Um, but it also allows us to now really derive and I, uh, so identify and prioritize strategic actions that we can then address. Uh, we address the systems engineering ones in the form of internal reviews that we hold quarterly. So these, this concept is it, our data-driven reviews that are built up off of the metrics that we have taken and then allow us to feedback and continuously improve, improve the program. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so this is actually what it looks like. This is what the um, uh, what program maturity looks like over time. Uh, we have uh, used these uh, activities, such as these data driven reviews, to uh, to really create a new maturity plot here. Uh, we are working. Uh, so this plot shows us in the orange line. This is the product of our learning curve. <laughs> this is where we could deal with issues on a one at a time basis uh, in an ad hoc fashion. Uh, we knew what we needed to do. We didn't necessarily have the processes in place to handle it. The blue line is the is the actual effectiveness. That's where we now have the processes in place. The the the, um, the various mechanisms that are now documented and understood and uh, uh, have buy-in from all of our various marine implementing organizations. Uh, this is where we are. There are our initial status. Um, the red line is an indication of where we are in, in our in our second quarter of our fourth year in the program. Uh, and it also allows us to identify and, and predict what we'll be doing in the future and continuously work on. Uh, and with that, let me introduce Dr. Tony Beasley of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. Hi, uh, my name is Tony Beasley. I'm the director of the National Radio Astronomy Observatory. I've managed to hold down a job over the last uh, several years. Please move on, next slide. Uh, what I'm going to do today is just give you a, a little bit of insight into the performance metrics we use for, for managing the observatory. Next slide. Um, just to give you some sense of, of what we do, we operate uh, telescopes for the research community. This is the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia. Next slide. This is the very large array in New Mexico, 27 antennas on an adjustable uh, configuration. Next slide. Uh, we operate the very long baseline array. This is 10 antennas um, distributed across the United States and operating in Hawaii and St. Croix in the Virgin Islands. Next slide. And this is the Atacama Large Millimeter and Submillimeter Array. This is a telescope we operate with our European and Japanese partners uh, uh, on the Andes in South America. So next slide. Uh, so in general, management requires measurement in some kind of framework, and that is very much the way that we operate the observatory. Uh, as we uh, operate the observatory year to year, about three quarters of our uh, funding and our effort goes into telescope operations, actually uh, operating the facilities I just showed you. And then in uh, parallel with that, we have development projects where we are uh, building new uh, uh, components for those telescopes or building new telescopes. And so that's kind of the mix, about 75, 25% of where our funding and where our interests are. Now, the uh, development side of the house is run in a very kind of standard way. We have a, a framework which is derived from the, the large facilities guide approach to things. Um, we use own value for very large projects and so on. And I'm not really going to talk about that so much today. Uh, the, the focus here is really about operations. Now, the operations of those different facilities and of the supporting sites that uh, you know, develop hardware and software and do the administration 
for those telescopes. We tend to run the operations of the observatory as a series of one-year projects. There are sort of boundary conditions coming from last year. Um, there is uh, the funding that we anticipate this year and what we want to get done before next year. Now, the, the sort of the driver for all of this is that we have a high-level strategic plan. We have a 10-year set of goals for what we want to do for the research community that is decomposed into a set of milestones. And then we have a program operating plan which slowly moves us through those milestones uh, year to year. So uh, as I mentioned, the operations are implemented as a series of one-year projects. In general, uh, we keep a, a close eye on risks. Uh, very much we look at the technical and programmatic risks that will impact science. Uh, we also try to you know, very much make decisions based on the, uh, the impacts of those risks and their probabilities and so on. And actually addressing risks is part of our annual budget cycle. Next slide. Uh, our management organization, Associated Universities Inc., uh, also has a, a metrics approach. Uh, they've explored concepts like the balanced scorecard approach and so on. Um, we do have a standard estimation and tracking cycle. And if we actually just go to the next slide, I'll, I'll show it. And so on an annual basis, beginning in January, um, you know, related to funding milestones from the, the NSF and the other agencies that fund us, we kind of walk through a schedule like this where, uh, you know, there are proposals put together and then there's a budget summit where we actually look at all of the allocations of the resources we're expecting. We determine what the program operating plan milestones for the next year will be. We update the long range plan and uh, eventually that's all reviewed and then we get to the top of the, the diagram again. And so this is very much the annual planning cycle. And I, I would say at most points in this cycle, there is some kind of metric evaluation of how we're going and uh, you know, what we did last year and what we want to do next year and so on. Next slide. So in terms of just raw spend on the observatory operations, this is an example of what we do. Um, the brown line is kind of our uh, expected spend for the operations, in this case, for the very large array in the Central Development Laboratory. And of course, these tend to be very linear. People eat their salaries. And so they're dominated by salaries and tend to be you know, relatively simple. In the blue, you see is the actual spend uh, against that plan each year. And this is kind of the way we tend to play. Um, you know, we carefully monitor the, the spend across all the different parts of the observatory. And we tend to underspend slightly where we can in case uh, something happens and we need to do some sort of extraordinary uh, uh, expenditure. Next slide. Uh, I, I mentioned to you that we have milestones. You can see on the left column there, there are POP milestones program operating plan milestones. These are the annual milestones that we uh, achieve across the different departments and divisions of the observatory. And then, uh, you know, as we move through the year on a quarterly basis, we report to the NSF on the costs and schedule and, and scope performance of those. And so if you go to the, the next slide, you'll see an example of the type of reporting that we do. You know, this is an example of one that, uh, you know, the scope is okay, the schedule has slipped a little bit and so on, uh, the cost is still fine. And so these are, you know, this is one of the more fundamental metrics we have. We uh, assess a set of milestones for the next year, and then we report against those milestones by measuring, um, you know, the quantitative aspects of, the, of these milestones. Next slide. Uh, we have a risk register. We actually operate an observatory level risk register. We also have additional risk registers um, in other places. And this is the fairly standard formulation of how we characterize the impacts and the potential uh, uh, you know, probabilities and so on. Next slide. This is uh, way too small to see, but you know, we have very high risks. Uh, you know, interestingly, COVID, of course, didn't appear on it before 2020. Um, but you know, on a regular basis, we review the risks quarterly or biannually sometimes. And uh, we actually spend money to try and burn down some of the, the risks associated with the hardware. Some of those telescopes I showed you are relatively recent and some of them are 50 years old, basically. And so, you know, uh, different types of risks turn up uh, with respect to the hardware and so on. Next slide. Uh, now that's sort of the operating uh, performance metrics. We do actually have sort of an observatory level set of performance metrics. And that is actually defined um, uh, in a report I'll show you in a moment. And so we have roughly 57 metrics across departments um, and looking at things like external deliverables where we actually assess our performance um, on, a, on, a, you know, on a regular basis. 
Uh, our experience of this is that this has been an excellent way to kind of take a snapshot of the performance of the observatory. And uh, you can have very specific ones looking at one of those instruments or some part of one of those instruments, or you can have metrics that really span the different uh, telescopes. Uh, uh, one that we won't discuss today that will be discussed this afternoon, I guess, is publication metrics, for example. Um, one of the, our experiences are that, you know, uh, the, the metrics need to be simple to understand and acquire. I think that when we did the first round of this, we chose some very meaningful to us metrics that were actually required way too much effort in some sense to gather on a regular basis. And so eventually, you know, you do it for a while and then it gets worse. And uh, I think one of our experiences was that the metrics should be very physical. It should be something that can be understood up and down the chain rather than, you know, dividing by complex factors and, and trying to uh, gather some other piece of information. Next slide. Uh, all of those metrics are defined in this uh, performance evaluation and management plan. This was something we went through with uh, the program office to define these metrics. And it gets updated on an annual basis. Every so often we drop one, which is not particularly useful or not telling us much and add another one, which is more relevant to what we're doing as we move forward. Next slide. So in summary, uh, you know, we have very detailed development and operations, estimation, tracking, reporting processes. We do very carefully watch how the observatory ticks. Um, uh, dedicated staffing is required. We actually have two people that are focused on both the reporting aspects here and uh, acquiring those metrics and generating the statistics and, and really doing that. And I think that was also an important change. We had to step up into that. Um, trying to make this the 11th thing that somebody else is doing is not a recipe for success, I think. We have a pretty good cycle, I think, of the, uh, you know, the annual pro process we go through, uh, sending and receiving information. And, you know, it, I, I think what we have at the moment pretty well maps to our efforts and uh, not a lot of surprises. Um, it's interesting, though, you know, this general metrics approach is not a substitute for common sense. Um, it is not perfect. And so, you know, we still have problems where people generate poor initial estimates and we review them, but we don't catch that, um, or they've made unstated assumptions. And, uh, you know, sometimes you, you have issues that uh, will, will turn up outside the metrics framework you have. And so you've got to keep an eye on that. Um, there are, of course, external influences, things like COVID and so on can come and bite you. Um, the other uh, con I would say about metrics is that, uh, yeah, people tend to acquire a job that someone held before them. And so you end up with these very um, static visions of how much uh, this we can do, you know, what the metric here should be. And so it can be very difficult to sort of motivate people to go far beyond that. Um, we have a project, which you see in the background of my slide there, where we want to build antennas which have mean time between failures, which are factors of a few better than the ones that we had. And it's just interesting, uh, you know, the people that we have and the, the metrics that we generate, they find it very hard to think about being able to change one of those metrics by a factor of three. And so you got to be careful you don't lock everyone into this beautiful framework and, and actually uh, uh, stop yourself from, from moving forward in it. So in general, I think these, these performance metrics are very important for us. They are very useful tools. They provide excellent insights and, and we use them. Uh, thank you. My, our next speaker is Ben Brown from the, the DOE. Thank you very much. Um, hi, I'm Ben Brown. I'm the Facilities Division Director of the Office of Advanced Scientific Computing Research at DOE. We're the part of the Office of Science that stewards our high-performance computing and networking user facilities. So my group has remit over four major uh, research infrastructures. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, that was, a, um, and you can go to the next slide. So I'm going to uh, kind of, I'm going to uh, go really quickly through these slides and sort of seed some high-level themes and as a uh, that are inspired by uh, work that I do with our DOE Project Leadership Institute, which is a leadership development um, uh, year-long program that we offer in the DOE community for uh, budding project leaders. To me, there's a couple of paradoxes of metrics, and I, this is a great follow-on to, um, to the previous um, to the, to the summary slide that you just presented. Uh, you know, we we know intuitively, right, that there's uh, the wider the audience of a metric, and some of these things go all the way up the 
the, the stack within the federal government to say OMB. It seems like we, we have a social phenomenon that the, the wider the audience, the more distant from the ground, the more reductionist they become. They get kind of squeezed and, and extracted down to the sort of bare metal, you know, that doesn't really get you a lot of insight maybe. On the other hand, when you have something that's really salient about uh, in, your, in your metrics that you're trying to capture and keep close to the living world of, the, of what's going on in the ground, it can be, uh, and I bet my dogs are going to start barking because there's delivery. So for apologies if they do, um, that there's this notion of salience of your metrics gets intermixed with a narrative kind of storytelling aspect, which can be challenging. Uh, next slide, please. But also fundamental to this issue with the relationship with our, your federal sponsor and your performer are issues inherently around trust and power. And metrics um, can be either a cudgel wielded with force by the by the sponsor, or can be an instrument for a trust-based interaction. Uh, next slide, please. Sorry about the dogs. So, one thing that I do in this uh, Project Leadership Institute is encourage people to check out this podcast. You might say, "Well, wow, this is pretty unusual. Uh, why go to a podcast about um, relationships at work?" If you're interested, the, the link's at the bottom right. But there are these dialectic tensions, these dynamic tensions inherent in any relationship. Sponsor, performer. Metrics are about expectations, dependency, the reliance and need for transparency, but also surveillance. And I submit in this discussion that metrics are a primary artifact of institutional partners reckoning with these tensions, most of the time subliminally. And there's a lot of power with drawing out onto the table. What are we really getting at? Next slide, please. And at the heart of this is alignment and sustained operational excellence in, in my experience in Dewey Office of Science with 13 years and really um, working closely with our DOE lab partners that run the facilities uh, and, and with other uh, federal stakeholders, sustained operational excellence, it's paramount, requires alignment between the partners and that metrics, in my mind, are a very particular tool uh, to, to structure a cadence of conversation and it's really up to us as, as individual leaders, is that going to be a trust-based or a power-based uh, conversation? Uh, next slide, please, which is my last slide. We'll get some time back. Um, so just one very, very high level. If I look at my, you know, our enterprise and the high performance computing and networking, we don't have a one-size-fits-all approach. We can't, I think we've already heard that. And there's a lot of tailoring that is essential in, in addressing, uh, you know, what, what is the raison d'etre for a metric? So in our world, you know, for example, we're looking at, of course, the bare uptime of the resource, then its utilization by end users. We're looking at whether the allocation of those resources conforms with established policies that, frankly, are always changing to respond to different maybe administration priorities or different needs in the community. And then completely separate from that, we have financial reporting, of course, that are bedrock to any uh, publicly funded enterprise. And even apart from that, project performance. So we heard, I think, a great uh, introduction in the previous couple of presentations. I'll we'll hear a little more. But what I tried to do in this simple slide is to illustrate that the cadence of monitoring versus reviewing these things is tailored, and the view, the venue in which the review takes place is parsed across different activities. So we have an annual operations review. We have a completely separate venue of conversation around um, budget and accounting, uh, and financial planning and strategic planning. And then with project management, that's typically handled in a completely different regime. So let me stop there and turn it to uh, Dr. Vanda Grubicic from NCAR. Thank you, Ben. Um, my name is Vanda Grubicic, and I'm the director of the NCAR Building Laboratory and an associate director of NCAR. NCAR is NSF's largest FFRDC, and we have been in service of the atmospheric community for the last 60 years plus. Um, and uh, the mission of the Earth Observing Laboratory is to develop and deploy observing facilities and provide expertise and data services needed to advance scientific understanding of the Earth system. Um, this is primarily focused on the atmosphere, although our systems are designed to uh, document, collect the data on other parts of the, of the Earth system as well. We do, as a laboratory, manage and operate the largest portion of NSF lower atmosphere observing facilities. And you see one of those um, in the background, uh, the one, one of the two NSF titled aircraft. Um, one of them is Gulfstream 5, the other one is the Hercules C-130. We also have ground-based facilities, um, uh, remote sensors, uh, radars and lighters, and various in-situ profiling systems. 
Um, we manage and operate those uh, facilities and deploy them in support of NSF-funded observational science field campaigns. Mission uh, includes both development and deployment of observing facilities, but here I will be focusing primarily on the deployment part and the metrics related to that. Next slide, please. But before I, I give you a, a, a taste and, and, and examples of some of the metrics that, that we uh, collect, um, I'd like to take a little bit of a bigger picture view um, and uh, speak about the type of performance metrics um, and where do they come from and what the reporting requirements are. So as the National Center, uh, as an FFRDC, um, we do, our management organization, University of Corporation of Atmospheric Research, um, has a cooperative agreement uh, with NSF. And in that cooperative agreement, there is a requirement that we provide uh, statistics, description and statistics of usage of major facilities that we manage and operate. That includes computational as well as observational facilities. And again, I will be focusing on a portion of those observational facilities. So next, next level is um, metrics related to service to the community. And that includes data, data services and, and data provision that, that we uh, provide uh, to, to the broader community. Those are at the laboratory level or an anchor level as a center. We track them, we evaluate them, and they feed into, into our planning, our operation and improvement of our, our processes. Uh, we track them also very carefully because they're part of the NSF evaluation of uh, five-year reviews of the National Center. You see the uh, metrics the database that we have includes specifically these field campaigns that EOL supports. At the operational level, uh, with the field campaign support, uh, we do track a number of metrics and do tracking and evaluation uh, with monthly reporting to NSF, our sponsor. Next slide, please. So to give you a flavor of, of the metrics, um, so this is specifically for the facility usage. We track a number of things. The requirement is allocations um, for individual LAOF, and that includes flight hours for the aircraft, for example, number of systems we deploy, as well as number of days in the field that we spend. Uh, we deploy our systems worldwide, as you can see in the map on the right-hand side. Um, and so all these um, numbers uh, we track carefully. We also administer the process for the request of the facilities and we track individual projects, field campaigns requested and approved. The final approvals rest with NSF. Number of less things on the list, it's not actually an exhaustive list, but give you a flavor, um, number of users, um, top type of the requesters, number type and geographic distributions of the universities served, uh, number of students involved in the supported campaigns and international collaborators in project using LAF. So tracking the number of projects in the lower left, you can actually see a COVID impact. Uh, one of the panelists has already <laughs> spoken about that. And it is really important to interpret uh, this in the, in the right way with the metrics that this is not um, our facilities being of less of interest uh, to the community, but it is impact of, of the pandemic. Next slide, please. Services, uh, we do provide a number of services in, associated with those facilities um, and we track uh, data services. The field catalog is a tool um, or, or a, uh, actually it's, it's an assembly of tools, suite of tools, um, and that is being carefully tracked and the number of requests for that. Design and fabrication services that we provide, uh, registered users of software and satisfaction surveys of field campaign PIs. That is an important piece that goes into our internal evaluation and planning uh, for improvements, which, which is done uh, sort of continuously. Data archive, field data archive is um, um, resident in our lab. And we track a number of things related to that freely available data, such as orders, data users, um, size of the um, of, of the archive and number of DOIs assigned to to data sets. Next slide, please. Finally, um, a few words on the metrics related to our operations. So the support of field campaigns worldwide um, is quite <laughs> um, de demanding and there are many risks involved. Um, even in the non-pandemic world, there are many risks involved. And we use the um, um, the, the standard software uh, for tracking uh, risks 
Um, we do that carefully. It is done at the project level, the field campaign project level, but then it is all uh, integrated at the laboratory level in the monthly reporting to the National Science Foundation. So tracking risks, um, tracking issues, um, working, of course, in associated with that on, on the resolution of, of these. And finally, um, the overall report uh, showing scope, cost, schedule, and resources as the main metrics uh, for each of these individual field campaigns uh, that we support. And we support on average six, uh, in the non-pandemic world, about six to eight of those uh, per year. So thank you. And with that, I turn on to Joan Workpile uh, from the High Altitude Observatory. I thank her. Thanks, Landa. I'm Joan Workpile. I'm a project scientist at the High Altitude Observatory at NCAR. I manage the Mauna Loa Solar Observatory, which is an NSF facility operated by HAO and NCAR, and I'm also the PI of one of the instruments at Mauna Loa. HAO is the Solar and Earth's Upper Atmosphere Division of NCAR. Our science mission is to understand the variability of solar outputs and solar activity. These drive space weather, and we also want to understand the impacts of those variabilities in space weather on geospace. These are needed to perform, um, improve our forecasting capability of space weather hazards and the impacts at Earth on our population and technologies. We work with the community to develop and advance models of the sun and the Earth's atmosphere from the upper thermosphere to the Earth's surface. HAO also develops instrumentation for solar and upper atmospheric research. And some of those innovative instruments are at Mauna Loa. Metrics collection I'm gonna focus on today is to understand the value and the use of our data by the community. We use a number of things, but I'm gonna uh, show metrics that we get from our registration, from the logs of our data downloads, the use of DOIs, manual searches of publications, and Google Analytics. Next slide, please. So we track both observational and model data that HAO provides. We have observations of the sun from Mauna Loa, CSAC, which is our spectral polarimetric analysis center that provides the community with science quality level one data from the Hinode satellite. We have Fabre Perot interferometers, FPIs around the globe, and um, sometimes on high altitude balloon flights that study the thermosphere. And we have solar eclipse expeditions. We have a number of models, some of which are the TGCM models of the thermosphere. There's also the Wacom X model which is a whole earth atmosphere model. Some of the solar models we uh, also track are, for instance, the Murum model. Some of the metrics that we use, I, I've shown here, which I think are, um, it's, a, it's a variety of things. To me, publications are the most useful. They're the most labor intensive for us to uh, track, but they really provide us with who in the community is using our observations or models, what exact data sets are they using? And, and most importantly to me, uh, how are they able to get their science done with these data sets? We track the number of our science users, which is useful. Again, it provides who is using the data, but also shows us trends with time. We can compare how many new users we have versus return users and how often people return. We do ask in our registration if people would be kind enough to provide this institution type, which is are they from a university, a lab, general public, K through 12. Again, it's useful. We track the type of data that's being downloaded, uh, which is great because we can track that also with time and user. We track number of downloads, which I find less useful because we do work to try to improve the efficiency with which people can sort and download what they want. So it's easier for them, but actually to decrease the number of downloads. And then sometimes we have users who are doing research projects that really require a vast amount of data and so that can suddenly spike on the number of downloads. Now, those metrics are mostly for our science users. We use Google Analytics to track the general public, and they provide a variety of information. But what I find most useful is that they identify what of our pages are most frequently visited. And in fact, we see that our education pages are the most popular, followed by Mauna Loa and HAO Science. Next slide, please. So this last slide is to give you a sample of some of the metrics that we do provide. On the far left, you're seeing the number of active users we have. I've sorted them by year. The color bar is telling us 
which of the data sets are being used by these active users. So we can track which models and, and observations are used. And, and if someone, um, for instance, maybe doesn't come back for a year, but hopefully that's not the case, they wouldn't show up for a year because they're not considered an active user. Our metrics for 2022 through February 13th show that we're on track for 2022 to be our, our highest number of users that we've seen. In the middle is the downloads, which I find a little bit less useful. That's actually a log plot. So you're seeing from 10, 100, 1,000, 10,000, that's 50,000 at the top. And so in 2019 and 2020, there were solar eclipses and new instrumentation and Mauna Loa drove those spikes very high. There were some people in the community downloading vast amounts of data. Those are the kind of the spikes I was referring to on the previous slide. And then in 2022, we are now on track to have um, more downloads than we had last year. An example of Google Analytics is shown in the upper right. They, they tell us where our users are coming from when they come to our web pages, and the vast majority of our users are in the States. And then in the lower right, we have um, information that some of our users are kind enough to provide us with, telling us where are they coming from. The blue is academic, so those are research, in, uh, excuse me, uh, colleges, universities, K through 12. The orange are research laboratories, and the gray is just general public or other. And so that's all I've got, and I'd now like to hand it off to Dan Wilson from UC Davis. That's great, thanks, Joan. Uh, this is uh, this has been really cool. I, it's, it's fun to see other people interested in kind of an abstract topic that you know, nobody around my lab likes to talk about. So. Uh, my name is Dan Wilson. I'm the Associate Director for the uh, Center for Geotechnical Modeling at UC Davis. Um, we're part of the uh, Natural Hazards Engineering Research Infrastructure Program at NSF. Um, we're, we're one of one facility within a group of about uh, eight experimental facilities around the country that uh, do natural hazards uh, research uh, infrastructure. At our site, we operate uh, two geotechnical centrifuges where we do hypergravity testing. Uh, we have a nine meter and a one meter centrifuge, and those are equipped with shake tables where we uh, simulate earthquakes on uh, geotechnical structures. And uh, next slide. Just to give you an idea of what that uh, kind of looks like and why we're doing that. On the left, um, you see a, a, a dam that's actually in Southern California. And one of the things we do as a societal risk is, is assessment of, uh, you know, what happens to this dam during an earthquake and, and what is our risk to society if, if, if uh, you know, if this dam were to fail, it has obvious consequences. And so there's actually quite a bit of uncertainty in these uh, analyses because we have fundamental um, uh, lack of knowledge in how, for example, gravelly soils uh, behave during earthquakes, whether they liquefy, whether how much they move when they liquefy and those kind of things. And as a rule, um, structures like this are very hard to uh, build models of and, and test um, at any kind of scale because they're very large structures. So we use uh, geotechnical centrifuges to build scale models of these um, different kinds of geotechnical structures. And the idea is um, we can simulate the stress within the model to be the same as it is at the larger scale. So in the middle, you see a small centrifuge um, where we can test a, a model that might be say uh, three, uh, three, uh, 3 meters wide at 75 Gs. That's something like 22 meters worth of soil and maybe about 10 meters deep. And that's a small component where we can look at maybe fundamental behaviors of, of the soil, understand how gravelly soils behave uh, on their own. And then on the right, you have the nine meter centrifuge where we have something like a 1.8 meter long container um, at 75 Gs. Now we're testing something that's 135 meters wide. Uh, we, can, we can do something that actually starts looking like an embankment. We can start doing a holistic boundary value problem uh, kind of analyses, something that might be on the order of 50 meters deep. And so this combination of equipment allows us to study fundamental mechanisms and how these soils behave uh, during earthquakes. Uh, this machine on the right is actually the largest uh, such a centrifuge in the world, um, equipped with a shaking table. And give a perspective, these, these, these experiments, um, you know, these middle container here, small centrifuge might be about a week to do an experiment. The test on the right, you might spend about two months to do an experiment such as that. And the, uh, the actual time of the experiment is usually about uh, half a second long. So two months of work, half a second of data. Well, next slide. 
So uh, important for the CGM is to realize that uh, we support users performing research. Our operational vision is to provide resources, service, and staffing. Uh, we get funding to support the users, but we don't do the research. And so we have lay out our strategic goals for operations and management in that perspective that we're, we're supporting research, not doing research. And I've given you the, the list of our six strategic goals that we have as a facility that are really oriented towards making sure we're providing that support um, in a way that, that, that we feel is important. And then we set us, our set of metrics and targets are mapped to those goals and, an, and a supporting set of objectives to make sure we're accomplishing uh, that mission. And so it becomes a, a, um, a real balancing act between looking at the, the, the high impact research output of the researchers versus what are we doing as a facility to support those researchers and how do we contribute to that mission. Uh, next slide. So what we, what we do as an operational strategy in, in, in doing our metrics is we've uh, established a two level system for, for um, of metrics for looking at our operations and ensuring that you know, our resource allocations align with our strategic goals and objectives. We have a low level set of metrics that are mapped directly to our goals and objectives. These are really in the weeds metrics. They're, they're, they're a diverse set of data um, that you really need to, to have an intimate knowledge of how the facility operates to interpret. And we use those as an internal management tool. And then we have upper level metrics uh, that are more aggregate performance parameters. And those are streamlined um, and, and they give us a higher level, level look into the facility and they're, and they're more appropriate for external stakeholder review. And then those are in our, our, our assessing operations and, and, and uh, uh, metrics. But we have a third set of metrics that are actually quite important in managing program income and cost recovery. And the idea there is of, of our facility in particular, we get about 80% of our budget from the National Science Foundation. We were an open facility. We had about 20% of our budget from other users, other sponsors. And so we have to uh, basically map our costs of providing services to the fees we recover from our users. And that, that mapping of metrics and services is, is a critical part that plays through our, our, our operations and plays into our um, assessing the operations as well. Um, down below on the table below, we kind of have three different categories of, of dealing with the different metrics and kind of the questions we're trying to answer. Um, you know, in the cost and income category, we really want to be able to see, are we recovering our costs and managing program income? And our metrics are uh, mapped to those costs of providing services. And the performance assessment, we want to know, are we reaching our goals as a facility? And our metrics are mapped to goals and objectives. Whereas with the external reporting, we're, we're really trying to answer the question of, are we delivering as promised? And, and those, the metrics and the presentation of the metrics are really geared towards providing transparency and trust in, in the operations that we're doing uh, what we promised we would be delivering. And it's important to realize that you have these, these metrics at the different levels and then the presentation and consumption of the metrics in different ways, but it's all one internally consistent set of metrics. And it's important to make sure that all those metrics are internally consistent and realize that they're being presented in multiple ways. Next slide. So just a few examples of, of metrics we use at CDM. Uh, these are very simple. Um, just, you know, we, we have a lot of them that pulled out a few easy ones. Um, so some of the, the lower level metrics we have, uh, for example, one of the things we like to track is uh, high impact test results. So we have um, uh, a list of first evers, we call them. Um, we want to make sure every experiment is the first time that this has ever been studied. It's the first time a test has ever been done with gravelly soils liquefying. It's the first time the model's ever been done with buried sensors able to measure uh, uh, sub subsurface movement. You know, every test has a first ever. And that's an important facility uh, uh, measure to make sure that we're really pushing the, the cutting edge um, as opposed to um, upper level metrics that might be a science day, uh, uh, real easy to, to, to look at and say, a site was on site each day, a site each day that somebody's on site doing work and project days where we can say, you know, how many people are on site each day? So five, five teams on site one day is five project days. And then we use these metrics to determine if we are maintaining an effective balance on demands of the staff and make sure we're able to, um, you know, in supporting science and doing the maintenance and also protecting some capacity for the site to uh, pursue opportunities to reduce risk. For example, and, and we have to predetermine, you know, how are we going to interpret all these metrics? Uh, so for example, a low number of science days indicates that users are not on site. We want to investigate that. And we look at a, a high ratio of project days, of science days, 
indicates that we have a, a, a lot of researchers working in parallel. So we that's part of our facility goal is to make sure we can keep multiple teams working at the same time in different areas of the lab. It means we're working effectively and efficiently. Uh, next slide. So in just in, in, in some, some conclusions, some lessons learned in, in metrics management, um, in our 25 years of operating this facility, um, the, the really key for me is the idea that we want to identify the data consumers and define the requirements and that targeted knowledge uh, before you start collecting metrics, right? How is the metric going to be used? What do we want to use the metric for? And we want to avoid tracking data that will not be consumed. We've heard that mentioned earlier in the in the in some of the presentations. You know, is this data really useful? Um, the data collector, on the other hand, um, needs to be responsible for describing how to interpret the metrics as presented, right? All, all the metrics, they tend to be, um, they're, they're abstracted up and abstracted up to get them into an area for higher level consumption. It's important not to just present that data, but also to present how to interpret that data so that, uh, so that it can be transparent and clear. Um, and realize that as you're doing that, the data can have multiple consumers. In fact, it's important that you know that you want to have the data consumed as many times as possible. And you want to make sure those goals are aligned. You don't want to have one person saying, you know, more days is better, and another person saying less days is better. Um, you also want to avoid metrics with impl implicit interpretations that don't align with the desired interpretation. Uh, days is another example of that, where um, you know everybody has an implicit assumption of 250 days a year. So if you're if you're being used 25 days a year that's not good, but you know, maybe 25 days a year is actually your target and that's what you wanna do. So you have to be very careful on how to present that data. And finally, uh, in that last stage of collecting and presenting the data, um, you're gonna, we, we expect to use aggregate met metrics for high level consumption, making sure we, we understand how are we gonna be able to combine this data. It's important to be in the very beginning when you're collecting the data to define how you're going to aggregate the data so that it can be consumed, answer that targeted knowledge but it's also important to realize um, you don't want to over analyze how the data is going to be interpreted. A lot of conflicts um, I've watched people go through and trying to make sure that this high level data can't possibly be misinterpreted. And that's uh, probably not the right approach is just uh, try to make it as transparent as possible and, and realize that these metrics should be triggering discussions, not automatic decisions and, and work it out to realize you were trying to be transparent in, in, in presentation of the metrics so people understand the operation. Uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to uh, Andreas Kalfer from the European Southern Observatory. Thank you, Dan, and thanks for sharing these interesting lessons learned. Um, hello, my name is Andreas Kaufer. I'm uh, the Director of Operations at the European Southern Observatory, ESO. And I'm responsible for the end-to-end -end operations of ESO's optical infrared observatories in Chile and the European contribution to the operation of the ALMA submillimeter observatory, which was already mentioned by Tony earlier today. Um, ESO is a um, European intergovernmental science and technology organization, 16 countries from 60 years ago, uh, this organization to fo which focus on the design, construction and operation of, of powerful ground-based observing facilities for astronomy. Uh, you see in the Background panorama composed all our facilities at the moment and some future facilities. So currently we operate two four meter class telescope at the La Silla site, uh, the very large telescope VLT, at, which is an array of eight, four eight meter class telescopes at Paranal. And we are currently constructing the 39 meter ESO extremely large telescope ELT at the Amazonas very close by. All these sites are in the, in the north of Chile in the Atacama desert. Um, because it provides the best sites for these kind of observations. Um, next slide. Our organization uses lots of performance metrics in different areas and different uses, but I, for today, I, I will co uh, focus on the on operations aspects um, and um, the operations performance metrics. They're all defined around the delivery of our quality control scientific data sets to the user community. Uh, to enable science and uh, and uh, to make the link to this afternoon's uh, meeting on science impact metrics this it is important uh, to for us that the production of of the scientific data which leads to uh, the publications is the starting point for all of the process which we are following our enterprise 
uh, um, idea of scientific observation, the program proposal over the execution to the data production at the observatory, the data reduction protocol, feeding the, the science archive with, with that uh, reduced or sometimes raw data, and then which triggers the, uh, the process for the, of writing papers, of course. And that's very much the focus. We would always try to keep this in mind. What is our final goal, which is to enable our community to do science. On the right, you see the simply publication statistics of the organization. The um, uh, VLT, the Very Large Telescope, is the main contributor with 600 uh, refereed publications per year at the moment. Um, other facilities are ramping up. Um, and it is interesting to note that in the total um, publications, 30% actually are coming out of the science archive. That means people who use the data who have not been involved with the original idea the original proposal that created the data. So we have invested into this more than 20 years and we see now that they're coming back this uh, um, as, a, as a huge benefit for the community. Uh, next slide. So we have a clear understanding uh, of how the providing observing time eventually leads to uh, papers production um, uh, over 10,000 of observations and programs we can run quite stable statistics, and we are we know that any hour of observing time we can we can provide uh, to the uh, community will lead to some publication at the end. So we are monitoring very carefully the use of the science time, the theoretical available time on sky for our telescopes, and and lose, um, uh, monitor very carefully all the losses. Uh, to see if we can optimize that. So I'm, I'm showing you here a breakdown of the VLT, um, how the time is, uh, which is available is scheduled and then uh, and the, ex uh, the execution success, the success statistics. We are investing about 7% uh, of the time on sky to um, for plant maintenance. Basically we take uh, uh, facilities out of operation to maintain them, to improve them, to um, uh, to make them uh, available and reliable. 3% of the time we invest into new capabilities. This is commissioning of new instruments, new, new facilities to, to stay up to the front of the, of the science with the new ideas, responding to the ideas of the, of the scientists. There's not much we can do about uh, some of the losses. One is the, uh, the atmospheric instabilities or weather. And uh, this is about 10%, but the sites, as I mentioned, are the best sites, among the best sites in the world. And this is a very low number in that respect. We are very proud that the observatories about our low uh, failure rates of the system. So our downtime losses are of the order of 3%. And this is one of the one part where we invest a lot of effort to keep it like that. We also keep an eye uh, carefully on the uh, scheduling and execution and inefficiencies, which is 7% is always a number we can work on. This is not a really a loss because data is still produced, but maybe not in the optimal way and uh, not exactly how it was specified, but it might still be usable for others. So, but uh, this is always something to work on. It leaves us with 70% of uh, the time really dedicated to scientific observations. Next slide. A little bit going more into engineering and the system engineering side there, our Teams focus on the actual performance monitoring of the, of the systems of those who produce the data, which is the telescopes and the instruments in our case. And if we see degradations or any exceptions, then this triggers corrective actions. I'm showing here on the left lower side, a, a performance plot of a telescope and instrument system of one of the four eight meters with one uh, an imaging instrument. And you see here that uh, the, with time, the lower the efficiency lowers, the throughput of the system lowers with time, because basically the mirrors are getting dirty or the oxidation of the surfaces is progressing with time. And uh, you see that the, the, the horizontal line is the target. And once it, the, the efficiency hits the target, we, we, we code, we illuminize these big eight meter mirrors and other mirrors in the, in the optical train. Uh, you can see here in 2021, you see a gap that was the, is the COVID gap when we, we did not operate for a few months, the observatories. Then we were still in a period where we could not bring the people to the sites to, to carry out such a corrective maintenance action. 
And, uh, and only recently in September, we were able to bring a large enough team to carry out one of these, these big operations. And on the right, you see how the freshly illuminized mirror is actually coming back into the telescope just before it's being mounted back to the telescope. So, and then the efficiency is jumping up to its nominal value. Just to show you a really a direct link of, of, of uh, measuring something and triggering activity. Next slide. Um, we are using the observatory performance metrics for many things, of course, tracking of operation status and performance of all the systems, including the infrastructure and facilities. So not only the direct uh, uh, science producing parts, but also these are very complex, large facilities at very remote sites. So they, they, there's a lot of challenges there, which need to be monitored. For all critical systems, we have KPIs defined. The targets for the KPIs is reset usually as the performance is commissioned. That's how we get the systems delivered. That's the performance we try initially to maintain. We can try to improve it, but that, that's usually our first reference. Um, any deviations from the targets trigger corrective actions. And we are uh, in the process of slowly moving towards more and more performance predictions and so that we can predict when a maintenance is required instead of triggering it when um, a threshold or, or a, a, a certain milestone is, is reached. So predictive maintenance or is, a, is a big topic for us because it, is a, it can drastically reduce resources and, um, uh, and time spent on, on uh, with not spent on sky for observations. So uh, observatory management is, uh, is uses also the metrics as a tool. We heard about that from others, planning cycles, scheduling. When we get new propo uh, projects proposed, we run cost benefit analysis of uh, bringing in the metrics and the numbers we, we low from existing systems because Many of our systems are similar. Uh, they have different uh, purpose, but they have a similar components and standardized components so we can extrapolate uh, um, a lot from what, what we know. And of course, reporting uh, uh, quarterly, annually is, is of course also part of, the, of that. And on my last slide, I, I just uh, want uh, to point at something which is becoming even more important for us uh, now. Uh, on top of the regular development of operation processes running basically through classical uh, PDCA cycle where the performance monitoring metrics of course comes in at the checkpoint of the cycle. Uh, we are now developing uh, new operation models for the new facilities which we have to integrate into the sites like the, the ELT or also the Cherenko telescope array in the south which will be hosted in our area as well and will be operated uh, as part of these uh, future Paranalas Amazonas Observatory. So the, uh, we are trying to develop these operation models, which with these new facilities bring new challenges while we have to run the old facilities uh, that uh, to bring these things together based on uh, data analysis for gathered over many years of operations. Thank you. And I am handing back to uh, Richard now on the next slide. Right. Yeah, th thanks, Andreas. And, and uh, thanks to all, all the uh, panelists. That was really uh, very interesting uh, material. So, uh, yeah, now we have we have 25 minutes to uh, to uh, it's time time for questions. Uh, so uh, Matt, that's the moderator for uh, for the question session. And uh, perhaps we can Ethan, we can line up question question number one. Thank you, Richard. Uh, yes, to all attendees, we did come up with a few pre-compiled questions uh, for our panelists, and it looks like we have about nine coming into the Q&A process. So uh, for the first one, how are performance metrics defined and used at your organization? And let me hand that first one off to uh, Tony Beasley. Certainly, we use them on a regular basis. As I said, we, you know, we uh, kind of start with a strategic uh, set of goals. We decompose that into a set of what we're going to do this year. And then as part of the normal operations of the observatory, both in terms of how it's running and the, uh, the outputs, the science output, um, things like Andreas just described, uh, we use them to make decisions. And so uh, in, as part of that annual planning cycle, uh, we have a moment, a, a budget summit in April, where we think about the following year. And if we see there are areas of the observatory through the metrics that are are not doing so well, or we perceive 
coming from the risk side of the house that there's something that could go wrong with something or other, we actually, you know, steer resources towards those issues. And so, you know, you can deal with uh, normal perturbations that way. Obviously, if there's a major external event, um, that's a difficult thing to deal with. And we tend to go back to the foundation in those situations. But I do think the, the metrics are absolutely used on a routine basis to make decisions about what investments to make, what changes to processes are required, and so on. Also, uh, let's pose this question to, uh, I'm sorry, Ben Brown from uh, DOE. Yeah, sure thing. And um, I see also in the, the Q&A chat box that uh, Heather Marshall asked a question about um, sort of trust-based metrics and what I was getting at there in my mm -hmm. super lightning fast um, uh, intro. <laughs> I, th I think it's, it's, I mean, it's cliche. It, it, there's no one size fits all. There's no one way and there's no one approach to a metric. So um, I mean, a couple of the answers in the chat, I was trying to paint a picture that, uh, you know, and as I alluded to, some metrics are forced upon us by even a statutory requirement. Uh, certainly in IT, we have a whole regime where uh, federal statutes require agencies to report all the way up to OMB and to CISA certain things. In other contexts, the metric really only exists as a prompt for a check-in between the sponsor and the performer at the most proximal distance, meaning like, hey, how's that thing going? We had that problem and you're, are you monitoring it? Can you, can you give us some insight there? And that could be a blend of frankly, narrative reporting and quantitative reporting. To this issue about that I was getting at with trust-based versus power-based, what I was alluding to is, again, not, not to be glib, but that, in any given interaction um, between sponsor on the federal side and the performer, um, if it's, the sponsor has the power to say, you're gonna report this, I need this. And the performer, by and large in my experience will say, salute and say, sure. But we know socially that there's a penalty to every single metric, honestly, to any given report, that's real human effort, that's real FTE time, and that's a real drag on productivity, potentially. If it's not aligned natively with the uh, kind of organically grown management and operating um, context within the research infrastructure. So when I get, when I'm alluding to trust-based, what I'm, um, I feel duty bound, honestly, on the sponsor side is to create psychologically safe conditions for conversations with enough time to transact the conversation around, hey, if I ask you to report this, what does that mean for you? Is that valuable to you? Oh, maybe you're already thinking about, you already do something that's close to that in your native systems. Well, that's good enough for me. Actually, I, I'm, you know, let's, let's, let's transact that. And to be, the last thing I'll say specifically is, you know, in our annual operations review cycle, we have a formal guidance document that frames out, you know, the documentation that's going to be a feedstock to the reviewers. And what we try to do a year in advance is contend with, hey, what can we take a look at the guidance? Does it still make sense? Let's let's allow the people even at the ground level who end up writing that stuff to throw up their hand and say, you know what, DOE, <laughs> you're asking me to write this stuff and it's like, it doesn't make any sense. You know, We, we really need to kind of get to better here. And, and so it's all about, to me, uh, sust you know, sustaining that hum of a psychologically safe space where people at different levels of the RI can throw up their hand and say, this works, this doesn't work, let's align. Thank you, Ben. Uh, we'll also pose that same question to Vonda. Thank you, Matt. Um, as I have already <clears throat> indicated in my presentation, uh, the definition of, of the metrics um, comes at many different levels. Um, so it, it might be a reporting requirement to the federal agency. It might be written in the cooperative agreement, such as hours on the usage of, of our facilities. Um, we operate the um, government-owned aircraft, NSF title aircraft, and with that comes a ro lots of metrics that we are requested uh, to collect and, and to share um, with, with the owner of the aircraft, which is the National Science Foundation. Um, but you know, well, coming down to, to that level, the, the interesting metrics that, that we define are those that actually help us uh, improve our cycle, improve our services, improve the portfolio. Um, let's say we, you know, the portfolio has changed over the last 60 years of, as you can imagine, of, of the facilities that we provide. And so that's the metrics at that level, program level, um, laboratory level, that is actually a very, very useful for us. Um, and I would like to highlight, I did mention it previously, but I would like to highlight actually user surveys, polls of the users of our facilities. 
that is a, a you know a, a, the very low low level we are collecting this for every single field campaign every project that we support and that is directly someone wrote that if it's unstructured it's even better because if, if it's a narrative and and the investigators are actually telling us um in in a direct um dialogue what uh, what benefited them what we could improve um, we definitely actively take that into, into our annual cycle and uh, um, in performance of, of the services that we provide. So metrics defined at many different levels. Um, so I'm simply a regulatory requirement on performing on the status of the, of the facilities um, down to metrics that improve us, help us improve our operation um, and service, service to the community. Thank you, Rhonda. Uh, with that, we'll actually move on to question two. And what are the performance metrics and reporting mechanisms internally or exter to external agency or stakeholders? And let's, Vonda, let's keep you on the line for that one. Set up. So. Okay, so the reporting um, in uh, many, many shapes and forms um, from the written, so there are the formal written reports um that have their cadence um from the monthly reporting for example on our status of um, preparation and support of the field campaigns that's both um verbal and um and mon monthly cadence verbal and written report so the the full documentation on that um, our reporting is uh, primarily to the external uh, stakeholders, uh, I would say the, the funding agencies, uh, funding agency, um, although internally we do report many things, for example, enter things into the anchor metrics database, uh, which is a center level uh, um, database. Um, Internally reporting to our management agency, which then indirectly reports, uh, which which then reports to the funding agency again. So many of the metrics that they mentioned enter the UCAR annual management report, and we are also um, ask provided data uh, for the management information reports, which is then you know it's con content of that is tracking um, tracking the usage of our facilities. Um, we do report to our users, you know, as the main stakeholders as well um, in form when, when we convene the community workshops and interact with them. Um, there is a degree of uh, reporting to the main stakeholders, uh, to the main users. Uh, thank you, Vonda. I'll, I'll also uh, answer, take a shot at answering that question. Uh, for us, from a systems engineering point of view, for example, we have multiple tracking mechanisms across multiple institutions. Uh, so as I was alluding in the presentation, that was something that took quite a bit of work uh, to create a common set of definitions of, for example, operational uptime <clears throat> and various operational uh, definitions. Uh, so that's something I have visibility into what the teams are doing. That's, that's internally, that's actually tracked via literally spreadsheets, uh, checklists that are updated by the operational teams on a regular uh, basis uh, at the one week level, uh, although will be updated more often in terms of any alerts and alarms that might go off for operational equipment. Uh, so that is something that we get in um, written form in a variety of ways in the, in the uh, at the program office level. Uh, to our external, to our funding agency, uh, we we summarize those into uh, uh, down to a variety of st statistics and uh, metrics that are reported in our quarterly report. Uh, so at this stage, it is something that does take some uh, um, uh, so quite a bit of people, the operational team monitoring what's actually happening uh, and what's um, and some filtering on our part to to uh, generate the statistics. Uh, but it all actually looks quite similar to some of what you've seen on on other other slides as well. Moving on to question number three. Uh, so how do you relate financial data and accomplishments to performance goals and objectives? Uh, that one, we do have Tony Beasley lined up for. Uh, so I, I showed some of the diagrams uh, where mm -hmm. we wanted to actually operate the, uh, the, the spend on the observatory kind of in an earned value sense. We map out what we should be spending and, and all of that. In terms of how do we relate the actual data and accomplishments to the performance goals and objectives, there are objective criteria for each of those performance goals and the, the technical and programmatic uh, 
directives. You know, the the equipment has to uh, perform in a certain way and so on. So the successful completion of those sub projects uh, is essentially earning all of the value associated with the financial input to those to those programs. Thank you, Tony. Uh, and uh, Ben Brown again as well. So. Yeah, I'll be brief. Uh, I really kind of think of the financial plane as in two separate but connected um, levels, if you will. One is the sort of monthly financial data that kind of tracks, you know, plan to progress, but more fundamentally cash flow um, mm -hmm. and, and burn rates for things and projects. And, and so that's it's very fine grained and it's inherent in the financial accounting systems that the host institution for the RI requires under the sort of Aegis and the DOE context, this would be like the DOE National Lab that's, for example, hosting the supercomputer. So we sort of try to, you know, leech off of the native financial accounting systems that that host institution requires all of their elements to use. Uh, but then on a higher plane, we at the federal level are, of course, uh, vectored about uh, the annual budget process, the federal budget process, and appropriations and long-term planning year over year. And so I alluded to my slide, something we call a budget deep dive or semi-annually we sit down for a couple of hours uh, with a prescribed homework assignment about uh, scenario modeling for different future budgets. And that's a whole other character of conversation. Again, the same financial reporting systems uh, energizing it and, and we're looking at real numbers, but it's a totally different kind of conversation. It's really about strategic planning and, and also the kind of the art of the possible uh, and also managing expectations. So, uh, Thank you, Ben. Uh, we also have Dan Wilson up for this one as well. Okay, thank you, Dan. <laughs> yeah, uh, thanks, Matt. So, you know, I want to come back to the way I mentioned earlier about the, the program income. And so, um, you know, when we talk about financial data and accomplishments, there's a lot of ways to relate it, as we said, but um, for, for us, the explicit tie-in, the explicit coupling of financial data and accomplishments is really done through the, the business model and through, through that program income accounting where we actually are tying in what does it cost to do this service? And, and it's, it's really important to realize that. So backing up a little bit, if you at our facility, and I suspect others are similar, when we talk about financial data, we're really talking about personnel. So we're, we're tying activities. 80% um, of our budget is in paying for staff. And so um, what are these people doing? Uh, what, what are their activities they're doing? And making sure in, in the program income uh, uh, category, making sure when we're doing services for a non-NSF client, that that client is paying the same amount as the NSF client. And so there's an explicit analysis that says, you know, the financial performance of doing the services and that's tied in. And then that that explicit tie-in then is needs to be consistently propagated through the other metrics and reporting as, as I've mentioned. So we we kind of back analyze and compare when we do other kind of performance metrics of how we did with our um, our, our, our that explicit tie-in on the program income. Thank you, Dan. Yes. Uh, we've got a question four. How are performance metrics used to inform decision making? Uh, first up, we've got Joan Burkpile. Yes, hi. I do have a slide on this, but I'm just going to meet it as well. Um, again, my focus is going to be on the science value of our, our observations and data models at Mauna Loa and NHAO uh, on really for the science community and the general public. So my, my first two uh, that I'm pointing out are from publication metrics. So I do go through the papers. Uh, I'm interested in the science for one thing. But what I also learned is how people are using the data. And these three are, um, the first two are specific to Mauna Loa. So I, I found that um, by, by observing how people were using the data, we have some instruments that are very flexible and we were able to sort of optimize our observing codes uh, to see, well, we, we might wanna run this program more frequently because that's actually more widely used by the community and it had a larger science impact. So, so in that case, we actually made decisions on how certain instruments were um, running their synoptic programs, for example. The second um, decision made for Mauna Loa data, I found some papers where a couple of different users were actually talking about, you know, they really enjoyed using this data, it was valuable, but they wish they had a higher cadence. And so we actually changed that to produce a much higher cadence. We have been providing the data two minutes and we're now providing it at 15 seconds. So we're trying to react to 
um, improving the scientific value of the data. And the last one relates to the general public. Um, when we saw from Google Analytics that the most popular pages overall are the education pages, we've actually been devoting more staff time to updating and improving those pages for the community. So those are some of the decisions we made based on metrics. Thanks. Thank you, Joan. And we'd also like to hear from Andreas Kaufer on this question. Yeah, thank you. Um, yeah, as an I would be happy to, to say that all our decisions are based on, on metrics and data, but this is sort of clearly, we are clearly not there yet. Um, um, but we have an ambition to go there because we are really developing now our operations model to become data-driven operations model to optimize the use of our resources in, the, in these growing infrastructures. They had new projects coming in, huge facilities um, at very remote sites uh, and the difficult sites in high altitude, etc. Et this forces us basically to, 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 to automize and to, to, okay. bring, to reduce the, the, uh, the people on site as much as possible. Having people there is always a, a cost and a risk factor for the people themselves. So there are great opportunities. I think if, particularly if you have new, uh, um, new facilities coming in because they bring in new thinking and they have new demands, new requirements. And that we, we are trying to use that and combine it with the experience from the existing metrics to be able to, to uh, develop the um, uh, operation in, in that direction. And if you allow me, I just wanted to touch on another aspect on decision making based on metrics. Of course, it's also a great tool uh, to, uh, to slowly steer um, organization people into a new direction. For example, we are adding now um, sustainability parameters into the uh, decision making process. For example, uh, all the, uh, the carbon footprint on um, created by our power, travel and um, uh, supply chain, particularly the supply chain is also non-negligible in these remote sites and their carbon footprint of those is, 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 is not low. And if you start to measure and to, to post and to report on, on this and then include these metrics into also the policy making and the decision making, uh, this is the way we, we are steering the, the observatory in, in that case towards a, a sustainable operation because uh, uh, in, in the moment the metrics is really used and you have a clear indication that this is the choice to go for the, the lower impact, uh, um, lower carbon producing uh, choice or in, if you uh, simply buy something, then is this of course um, is already um, part of the implementation of the organization's policy and strategy. So uh, we are also using the, these uh, performance metrics in this direction for decision making. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas. Uh, we do have two more questions. I'm going to ask question number five, but I will skip question number six because I believe we've been addressing it in a variety of ways, and we'll jump to uh, some, some of the questions that are coming in on the Q&A. Uh, but we will include question number five. How do you tell if your performance metrics are useful and meaningful? Uh, Joan, do you have a response? Uh, yeah, well, for, for us, um, one of the ways we tell since we're trying to increase the value of the data, the scientific value, is you know how, how are our users trending? Uh, do we have more people publishing with our observations, which is why I, I focus mostly on the publications, but also looking in general to see how many people are returning to use the data. So, so why, I'm really looking at it from a, a publication point of view, and then how, how are our users returning? How often are they returning? And, our, and so to me, those are the metrics that I'm going by is most useful and meaningful. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. I, uh, I will take a cut at this as well. Uh, I do believe we had sort of an interesting knock on effect, I would call it, uh, in the sense of vendor management. For example, our operational teams are keeping track of uh, operational history, meantime, between failures, failure rates, failure modes. Uh, this is something that we actively manage our vendors uh, that supply this equipment that we use. Uh, it's a relatively small community, uh, and we have uh, several success stories of over the years uh, working with vendors, providing information back to them, uh, and their product has been improving, and in the, in the end, the average customer base ends up uh, benefiting from that. Uh, so that's something we've actually done some tracking over time. Uh, with that being said, in the interest of time, uh, there are 
looks like about 15 questions that have come in. There's some very good questions. Uh, a dozen of them have been answered in line, so I will look at some of the some of the open questions. Um, uh, some of these are. Uh, let me jump to um, uh, one from. I like the use of systems engineering tools to craft reporting metrics, and it is clear that each RI has the has to have tailored reporting metrics. Are there resources, system, and engineering tools to explore tailoring these metrics to the needs of an individual RI, or is this one of the goals of the workshop? Uh, this is a first. Uh, let me start there, and uh, if any of the participants would like to join, feel free to raise their hands. Uh, this is the first time this topic has actually been uh, part of the large facilities workshops or webinars. Uh, so this is something that is quite new. I can certainly speak from my own perspective that, uh, it, or as you've heard from many of the panelists, is there are industry standard types of things to do, but the, the real trick is to uh, uh, provide, uh, tailor it down and uh, 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 really customize the, uh, the actual performance metrics to, uh, to the individual RI, for example. Well, we're, okay. uh, Matt, yeah, uh, sadly, we're running out of time because we've yes. we only got, uh, I mean, there, so there's been uh, some re really interesting questions uh, posed in, in the Q&A, and I, I note that panelists have been uh, uh, busy uh, typing answers. Uh, certainly we'll uh, commit, that we'll, we'll be saving all of these questions uh, and the answers, and we will be uh, posting them on the uh, NSF uh, Knowledge Sharing uh, Gateway, uh, along with the um, the, uh, the the recording of, of this presentation, and we we will uh, try and, uh, and and provide some some written answers to to, to these questions that have been uh, posed uh, with some extra homework for the, for the panelists uh, there to do so. But I think it's been a been a really a really interesting uh, session and, and a lot of questions there. But I, I think we we have to have to have to close it up now. So, so first of all, th uh, thanks thanks to all of the panelists and, and to uh, and to all of you uh, for for your interesting uh, questions uh, there. I think we could have gone on uh, quite a bit uh, quite a bit longer. Um, and if you have a, if 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 you think of a question um, later on today that uh, that pops into your head and that we didn't get you didn't get time to uh, answer, then please e email it to. Uh, the research infrastructure outreach at nsf.gov and we will we'll endeavor to uh, to uh, supply an answer for that and and the the q a session will also be posting it on our communities of of interest uh, portal um to for, to allow people to uh, communicate and, and and collaborate and a reminder we we will have uh, have another interesting session uh later on today starting at 2 p.m eastern time uh, this will be on science impact metrics. So th th thank you, thank you all uh, very much, and, and thanks, thanks to the panelists uh, once again. That that was uh, really interesting.